It was like they always say, your life really does flash before your eyes. There it all was, stretching back to my childhood. Born into a family of master thieves that went back for generations, I was next in line to continue the Cooper name. But fate had different plans. I was robbed of my childhood when a ruthless gang attacked our home. The orphanage I landed in wasn't all bad. It was there that I met my lifelong friends. Bentley, he's always been the thinker. And Murray, he's the doer. We'd stuck together over the years, and our skill, our confidence, and our thieving reputation grew stronger with each heist. We thought that the good times would never end, and that our luck would never run out. Which only made things tougher when the odds finally caught up with us. Then I met this guy, McSweeney, who claimed to have run with my father's crew back in their heyday. They pulled jobs all over the world and amassed quite a collection of priceless items. It was then that McSweeney told me all about the Cooper Vault. It seemed that my father, like all my ancestors, had been hiding their wealth in a secret place for generations, each one adding to the treasure hidden behind a door that if McSweeney's story is true, only a Cooper can open. Using some well-placed clues provided by McSweeney, we set out for the secret island that held the vault. On arriving, we discovered someone by the name of Dr. M had already set up shop. From the looks of it, he'd been trying to crack the thing for years, growing steadily more frustrated in his failures and more paranoid as the decades rolled by. He built himself a fortress with security as tight as Fort Knox. Getting inside the place would take precision, creativity, and moreover, it would take an army of world-class thieves. Finding and bringing together that much talent won't be easy, but to get inside the Cooper vault and collect my inheritance, I was willing to pay the price. Getting inside a world-class vault would take a team of world-class thieves, a group of specialists, each member contributing their own particular talent. It was clear that we needed Murray back. Not only was I missing a lifelong friend, but his brute strength helped get us out of more than a few scrapes in the past. When Bentley was injured during the whole clockwork affair, Murray blamed himself, eventually leaving the team. We tried to console him, but going out on his own was something he needed to do. He said he wanted to find his spiritual center. We got word that Murray ended up in the Australian outback, where he studied a mystic art called the Dream Time from an Aboriginal guru. From all accounts, things went pretty well, and his teacher even sent him on a walkabout to locations all over the globe to complete the training. Latest reports have cited Murray in beautiful Venice, Italy, but what he's doing there is a mystery. I just hope he steers clear of the local mob boss, Octavio. Growing up, this guy used to be a real celebrity in the neighborhood. Everyone loved to hear him sing opera and said he was destined to be the next great tenor. But just as his career started to take off, musical tastes changed. Suddenly, it was all about rock music and no one wanted to listen to opera anymore. He held on to a few fans, and it was these mobsters that took him into the business. Heading onto this guy's turf was dangerous, but worth it for a chance to make things right with Murray. With the fight over, we went back and scraped Bentley off the pavement. 
It was touch and go for a while there, but we managed to sneak out right under Carmelita's nose. Octavio wasn't so lucky. The guy got 30 years behind bars for what he did to Venice. I guess Italians don't like it when you sink their landmarks. Ironically, he found success as a singer while in jail. After all, most of his old fan base was already in the clink. But the big score here was bringing our old pal back into the gang. Once he put on those gloves and that mask, it was clear to everyone, most of all him, that the Murray had returned. At first, it seemed just like old times. The gang was back in action. But little by little, we learned that Murray's heart just wasn't in it. Without the guru's permission to give up on his dreamtime training, he'd never really feel comfortable returning to the gang. We knew we needed to help him out. So, we packed up our things, whipped up some quick disguises, and headed for the Australian Outback. Along the way, Murray told us story after story about his teacher's amazing abilities. Apparently, this guru of his was capable of fantastic feats. He used the dream time to blend perfectly into his surroundings, and even gain mental control over the weak-minded. If even half the stories were true, then this was a guy I just had to meet. Our gang needed to grow its ranks for a chance to get inside the Cooper vault. And this guru, this outback mystic, was looking like the best recruit we could have ever asked for. However, when we finally arrived in the outback, it was a shock to find that things had changed. And the guru was nowhere to be seen. Carmelita just lay there, unconscious, helpless on the desert floor. Being gentlemen, we kept watch over her throughout the night. Her camera proved to be a real source of entertainment as we took turns posing. Didn't want her to go home empty-handed. Morning broke, and we got a clear view of the landscape. It was beautiful, empty of the miners that had been digging and drilling into the sacred place. The moment was broken as Carmelita began to stir, and we prepared for another quick exit. Only this time, it wasn't just the three of us. For the first time in Cooper gang history, we picked up a new member, and the team would never be the same. Bentley was obsessed. Every night he'd pour over the blueprints to Dr. M's fortress, looking for a way to get into the Cooper vault. He soon came to the conclusion that there was no way inside unless the gang picked up a dedicated RC specialist. An expert who had mechanical and piloting skills far exceeding his own. After weeks of searching techie chat rooms, he finally found someone who could keep up with him intellectually. A gearhead genius out of Holland named Penelope. She politely declined our invitation to join the team, saying she only works for the best. Apparently, her idea of the best 
was her boss, the Black Baron. A big time dogfighting champ up there in Holland. He's so good that he's even set up an international competition called Aces to attract worthy opponents. A few days later, she sent us a counteroffer. If our gang could manage to beat the Black Baron at his own game, then she'd know we weren't just a pack of jokers, and therefore, worth her time. So, we got busy. With no time to lose, Bentley and Murray worked to put a plane together, while I got my pilot license the fastest way possible. We'd prove to this Penelope that the Cooper gang was up for the challenge, even if we were making it all up as we went along. Quite a revelation, Penelope and the Black Baron were one and the same. But before we could even process this turn of events, we were rushed to the winner's circle. Somehow, against all odds, we become this year's champions. There was a bit of an awkward moment between Bentley and Penelope. I guess the photos they'd sent each other over the internet were a bit... exaggerated. That night, Penelope explained that the disguise was invented to get her past the dogfighting league's strict age requirements. However, after winning, the Baron became a celebrity, and she found herself putting on the costume more and more often. But now, with the Black Baron out of the picture, she was free to take up a new path, and she joined the gang without hesitation. The next day, our newest recruit treated us to a week-long aerial tour of Holland. She was fitting in just fine. After a careful analysis of Dr. M's fortress, Bentley came to the difficult conclusion that his demolition skills just weren't going to be enough. If we wanted to get inside the Cooper vault, we'd have to recruit a full-time demolition specialist. However, Bentley's proposed candidate was a shock, my old enemy, the Panda King. As a member of the original Fiendish Five, he had a part in taking out my dad and stealing pages from the thievious Raccoonus. Eventually, I caught up with him, and I claimed back what he had stolen. There was no way I was going to let that monster on my team, but Bentley was firm. He discovered the Panda King had left his life of crime, and was now a monk living the life of quiet meditation high up in the mountains. I wasn't at all convinced, but there was no denying that he had the skills we needed if we were to succeed. So the gang packed up, put on our disguises, and headed east to China. The Panda King wasn't any more excited about the notion of him joining the gang than I was. If it weren't for the guru, who for some reason really hit it off with the old guy, the whole deal would have been a bust. We could see the anger in the Panda King's eyes as he recounted how he lost a member of his own family. A daughter who was abducted by a powerful general from the northern mountains. She was to be the bride in a forced marriage to this unscrupulous ruler, and Panda King was exiled. We agreed to help him recover his lost daughter in exchange for his skills in the Cooper Vault job. 
I still wasn't convinced this was a good idea, but a deal's a deal. General Sal had his wedding right on schedule. Everything was as he'd arranged, except the bride came as kind of a shock. Carmelita was a little disappointed it wasn't me she busted at the altar, although I doubt she minded taking Sal into custody. He did after all plague the streets with the undead. From what I hear, the locals were happy to see him go. We dropped off Jean King with her aunt. The Panda King insisted that she be safe there and that he needed to pay off his debt to the gang. I was still wary, but there was no denying that his skills would come in handy. Needless to say, we lived it up in the back streets of Shanghai. What kind of gang of thieves would we be if we passed up on recreation like that? We got the message late one Saturday night. Dimitri was calling in the favor I promised him back in Holland. He'd gone ahead and booked the whole team passage under assumed identities to none other than Blood Bath Bay. Easily the most lawless town on earth. It's home to a group of cultural hermits who doggedly maintain the ways of their pirate forefathers. The cruise over gave us some time to get the rundown from Dimitri. I guess his grandfather, Remy Lestow, was a pioneer in deep sea diving. He'd made a fortune looting undersea wrecks. Although his luck ran short when a young cutthroat by the name of Black Spot Pete stole not only his loot, but his precious diving gear as well. A broken man, Remy retired from treasure hunting and eventually started a family. Dimitri, growing up on his grandfather's stories, dreamed of one day recovering the gear. So that was our task. We've been called in to get our hands on this miraculous diving equipment. Not all bad, really. If things go our way, the team might get a frogman out of the deal, which Bentley figures will be a big help cracking the Cooper box. That Bentley, always thinking. Lafui was beat outsmarted by our own resident genius. Who'd done more than just rescue a team member, he'd won himself a girlfriend. It was nice to hear him talk. They'd have these conversations the rest of us couldn't even follow. Far as I could tell, they were made for each other. Dimitri was in love too. The new diving gear had gone to his head. We were informed that he'd be our frogman for the Cooper vault job. Not that any of us had even asked him. For the first time in memory, Carmelita didn't show up and cart everyone to jail. Oh well, I'll send her a postcard. You know, I'd hate to have her feel left out. All these memories, they just bring me back to the same place. Getting crushed to death in the fist of some genetics experiment gone wrong. Not the way I thought I'd go out. Shame, really. Now that we've got this big gang... Gang. More like a pack of misfits. 
Either way, we'd become a team. We had some real potential there. Could have pulled off some big jobs. <sighs> we were so close. The door to the Cooper vault was opening. But that Dr. M. If there's any justice, he'll get his. I just wish I'd seen what was in there. A stockpile of my family's accomplishments. Would I have measured up? What would I contribute? Would my father have been proud of me or ashamed? Funny, but here I am at the end and suddenly all I can think about is what a coward I've been towards Carmelita. I never took the next step. Looking at Bentley and Penelope, it's clear what life is about. If Carmelita was here, I'd tell her straight out how I feel and quit playing around. Put our professional differences aside and see if we can make it work. But that'll never happen now. I can't take this crushing. Just let the pain stop. over the Cooper fortune, and he wasn't going to give it up, no matter what the cost. Our exit was a little rough, but Murray managed to get us out just in time to witness the final fate of the Cooper legacy. It was a bittersweet moment, the end of the road always is. We both looked on, lost in our thoughts, thinking back on all the adventures that had brought us here. The people we'd met and places we'd seen. We'd worked for a long time to get Sly into that great vault, and now its secrets were hidden again, this time for good. I could only hope that he'd found what he was looking for in there. We searched every inch of the island for Sly, retrieving the gang one by one, only to make the surprising discovery that he didn't want to be found. As always, he'd left a calling card, only this time, it was worth millions. The months rolled by, and when Sly still hadn't shown up, Murray headed back east to complete his training with the Guru. Without Sly as our leader, for the first time we each had to step out on our own. A difficult thing we'd been together ever since we met at the orphanage. To this day, Murray and I are still close. Recently, he's been trying to break into the pro racing circuit, stock band class. Things are looking good. He's got a unique talent for living through crashes other people would have found fatal. Just always bounces clear. And of course, there's Penelope, my new partner in crime. Let me tell you, I'm in love. She and I have set out on a journey that I never would have dreamed up while running with Sly and Murray, although I hope our paths will cross again soon. So while this might be the end of our adventures together, it could be the start of something even bigger. Time will tell. Literally. Cause I'm building a time machine to find out. Dimitri went on to become a celebrity skin diver. The ladies flocked to him, and so did the money. I got a postcard from him once. It said, I'm here, wish you were fine. Like me. He's his own man. The Panda King returned to China and lived a happy life living two doors down from his beloved daughter. She, of course, was pleased to have him screen all of her future suitors. As of yet, she's still unmarried. The 
the guru returned to the outback and took on some new Dreamtime students. One of which was a high-profile rock star that brought a lot of unwanted media attention. Last I heard, he was hiding out in New York City. Figured it was the last place they'd ever look. devil. Show your bling and let me shine you. Thank you. 
It's like a big, uh, impressive, kind of Riviera feel, high class, very yeah. Sly, Sly Cooper very style. Cool. Yeah, just figuring out the evolution of the gameplay between Sly 1 and Sly 2. This was, what, six months we worked on this? Eight months? Yeah, a shamefully long amount of time. And it didn't even make it into the game. Yeah. But it was sort of the, uh, the, like, the conceptual building block for how we were going to construct slide two, which was a big departure from slide totally, one. I mean, totally. you can tell like it's all non-linear in how you move through this space. Totally. Which is a pretty, pretty radical shift for us. I remember in this level, uh, we were going to have Bentley steal a giant yacht and smash it through all of these docks and eventually uh, bash it into that large uh, building, which was a casino, so that the Cooper gang pulled off a pretty sweet heist. Those are the smartest guards ever. I know. But at least they stand at attention. You know? <laughs> Sly attacks them and they're, yeah. they're there. They're very present emotionally. I love this cop boat because it uh, features the fine Sucker Punch tradition of Writing poor French on things. <laughs> and months. So we're now back at slide oh, one. BT. Do you read me? Yeah, Bentley, I hear you. I've just identified a potential problem. See that filthy game? I love, there? you know, we, we, we kept the same Bentley the from the room, very first just hideout. kind of voice uh, experiment. Okay. But that's slide. Oh gosh. my gosh. My new climb move. Climb move. <laughs> oh, man. Have you ever wanted so like to punch a character in the face more? That would be it. Yeah, Bentley's a pretty interesting nice. guy, the oh, voice of Bentley. Mm -hmm. He's a friend of the fell in the office. He worked in a record store down the street yeah, from me. Yeah. Jump and hit the circle to <laughs> be nice to go in and get a uh, recommendation on an album. And he ended up being the voice of Bentley. Yeah. Well, it'll give you record recommendations in the Bentley voice. <laughs> well, I think you want the one. <laughs> Two shelves down. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, look at oh, the dancing cash. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is video money. game good times, like dancing, <laughs> dancing inanimate. Off. Well, I guess it is animated. It's dancing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, even this music I remember. I can't listen to this CD anymore. So this is the same level we we're just looking at, just in a obviously much more primitive form. Look at the animations. Dude. Oh yeah. Silas. So like he's got a problem. <laughs> yeah. What's his wow. deal? 
If you saw somebody in real life running like that, what would you assume would happen to them? Um, hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking burn victim. <laughs> Back injury? Fused spine? <laughs> Fused spine? Oh, yeah. Uh, we didn't have the cell borders on Sly. No. Sly's cane could transform into many unique devices, including this fabulous number, which would allow you to see an invisible maze. So amazing. We were so bad in the term to put this in the game. This level went through the entire development run. Everybody in office touched it. At least once. Yeah. It's funny that parts of this level actually did ship in Sly 1. Probably. Sly versus the huge pistons. Why is Sly always evading large machine parts? <laughs> if I ever get rich, I'm gonna hide all my money around <laughs> huge moving parts. And I have open fire pits. Yeah, I love to fire right near my my folding paper cache. Oh, check out that dynamic move. Actually, it's interesting. That this is a really, really old movie, but Sly's still doing those uh, cane swings off books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that where you came up with the idea for the cane in the first place? No, it was, uh, it was more of a question mark. Because <laughs> he's a raccoon of mystery? mystery. Which is clearly evident in this video. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that masked character Here. swinging on the well, one thing that I kind of wish that we didn't get rid of was the original idea was that Sly's eyes you should always be able to see them, even in the dark. So, like, you'll see here, and he turns around, <laughs> if he ever turns around again. Um, but how his eyes pop out. Yeah. Oh, remember that checkpoint with the Sly logo on it? We had a lot of arguments internally about whether or not there would be Sly iconography in the world that belongs oh, to the Oh, yeah, boss. yeah, yeah, totally. It would feel more like stealing if you didn't run across stuff that uh, belonged that to belong you. To you. Yeah. Uh, he's finally made, he's made it in. I like that most of our conversations internally are about what would make it feel more like thieving or being a thief. Uh, at this point, I think we're pretty aware of what it takes to be a thief, and if we lose our jobs... <laughs> we can... We, we got another line of work. Yeah, we've got it. <laughs> our second career is all lined up. <laughs> oh, the freeze oh, fish. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, it made sense that we wanted to slide the freeze thing. Will be recognize it. Yeah, well, we gotta know, right? Yeah. Like, uh, players oh, will not good. know that they can freeze, freeze. water, so, so they should... Something like something fish. iconic, yeah. yeah. Who doesn't want to freeze a fish? <laughs> oh, the crab takes it again. <laughs> and this is... I like that we made the NPC orange, so that you can't tell from where he is on the floor. Oh, right. So the orange NPC on an orange, an orange platform. That's part of his cunning camouflage ploy. Totally. <laughs> if anyone asks, it was completely to make the NPC look extra smart. <laughs> <laughs> Money popping up out of holes. <laughs> so interesting seeing the, the character without a cell phone. I really like that old thing where the money would fly, fly like butterflies yeah. into your pack. Yeah. It's pretty, you know, uh, sort of pretty. surreal. Yeah. But uh, it's rewarding. Yeah. Didn't we have problems using uh, green money because it wouldn't localize into yeah. different countries? Uh, it truly illustrates a, a problem globally that we have different colored money. The video game industry would really benefit from one colored. Oh, the underwater approach. approach yeah. You'll notice that's the same fish that was the freeze fish. <laughs> just kept <laughs> using it. <laughs> Slap. Oh yeah, you can change the wings yeah. on the underwater we'll vehicle to go through different openings in the cave. Yeah, if I remember correctly, Raleigh's level was supposed to entirely be underwater. Yeah. Yeah. That was going to be our first level of the game, yeah. underwater, because it was going to be easier to do it that <laughs> way. Oh, man. Oh. Very intense. Uh, this, this is amazing. This old Sly, it's good. Was this PC? I don't know. 
You know, frankly, like I've blocked this slide out of my memory. <laughs> as, far as, as far as I'm concerned, the slide we know today kind of sprang up fully formed. He's like got boxing gloves on and mm -hmm. big clown shoes. Clown feet. Yep. <laughs> oh, but check it out. He's a, he's a dynamo in action. <laughs> Wow, puts out a pet. Stairs, oh yeah. Video oh. games are all about like fantasy fulfillment, yeah. and here we're fulfilling the fantasy <laughs> of ascending a blue staircase. <laughs> <laughs> but watch out kids, there's lava up ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I never really noticed, but Sly's in a lot of caves in these demos. <laughs> Uh, all those stretch textures and careful, careful sly. Yeah, careful sly. Don't trust ambiguously oh. shaped objects. <laughs> <laughs> Dev, I don't know if you know it, but uh, orange means yeah. lava. Lava, totally. Lava is bad for video game characters. In a video game In a video yeah. game? Lava. It is. At least in most video games, that's the case. However, in our game. We uh, decided that it didn't hurt Sly at all. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, so he, he could run in lava. Yeah. Whereas the modern Sly, he can't swim. Totally, totally. But he can run in lava. It's the clown shoes. <laughs> Completely. Totally. He used to be a lot tougher. Yeah. Is what did. this video tells me. Cool. Yeah, it's an impressionistic painting. <laughs> it's a Dutch masterpiece. I kind of miss the Sucker Punch era of rolling lava rocks. <laughs> I feel like that was a real staple for us. Yeah. Not too Fifi, though. Not too Fifi, no. Oh, the big guy, the original, the pretender. Check out that meme.